Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday devotional for October 29th, 2023, Reformation Sunday. Our silent meditation comes from Philip Schaff, or Schaff, 19th century teacher at a seminary that would later become my alma mater, Lancaster Seminary. He says this, <clears throat> Because of the Protestant Reformation, the Bible ceased to be a foreign book in a foreign tongue and became naturalized, and hence far more clear and dear to the common people. Hereafter, the Reformation depended no longer on the works of the Reformers, but on the Book of God, which everybody could read for himself as his daily guide in spiritual life. This inestimable blessing, excuse me, this inestimable blessing of an open Bible for all marks an immense advance in church history and can never be lost. We'll be talking about the Reformation, what it meant then, what it means now. For announcements, um, a reminder that next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. We'll be remembering our loved ones who have gone to be with the Lord particularly those in the last year. It will also be a Communion Sunday. Let's begin our service. <clears throat> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Our profession of faith, appropriately for today, begins with the Heidelberg Catechism, question one. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, <clears throat> Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. This we believe. And join me in the spirit of prayer. <clears throat> Ever calling God, we give thanks that you have gathered us into your church and graced us with your faithful presence. We ponder our history, ancient and still developing, and marvel at the many expressions of your church. Grant us the vision to be a part of a new affirmation for the church that will bring ever more joy and justice to the world. Continue to gather us, the diverse lot of us, into Jesus' vision and dream, that your faithful people may be one in you. Amen. As heirs of the Protestant Reformation, <clears throat> let us put aside our good works and remember that we do sin and that we do fall short of the glory of God. And let us pray together. Lord of all, the demands of your righteousness are too hard for us to fulfill alone, so we make excuses and ignore your law. You forgive our iniquity and remember our sin no more and we abuse this freedom as if it gave us permission for more selfishness, self-indulgence, and self-righteousness. You give us the gift of grace, atonement in the blood of your Son, yet we make it cheap, without serious repentance. We fail to see the power of your faithfulness. We are your people, but do we know you as our God? Forgive us, Lord. This for the sins we know in our heart and save us Lord from the sins we hide God of our refuge and strength have mercy on us write your law on our hearts amen let's spend a few moments in silent prayer Amen. God does show us God's own righteousness and divine forbearance. Through the work of the Holy Spirit given to us, 
we may come to know the truth and be made free. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, sets us free from our slavery to sin. Our sins are forgiven. Through his death and resurrection, a place is made for us in the household, and we may be known as children of God. Thanks be to God. We come to our children's time, so gather the young folk around the device if they're not there already. We have a picture. We've got a character there that may be familiar to many of the local people. This is Cosmo from Nobles Amusement Park. And we have a sign where he's showing you that if you look quickly, it says, well, you got to be this tall or you can't ride the ride. But if you look more closely on the other side, it says, <clears throat> you can get away with being only this tall if someone rides with you, an adult. Sometimes we only see the one part of that sign. We think, oh, we're not allowed, forget it, can't do it. But when we look more closely, we realize, hmm, if someone can help us, like an adult riding with us, then we can still do that. You're young, but there are a lot of things in life where we think, oh, we just can't do that. Particularly when it comes to pleasing God, following God's commandments. We say, God, it's too hard, it's too tough, can't do it. But if we look more carefully, we realize with Jesus, we can. We can do these things. So don't give up. Look for help when you need it. And when it comes to your relationship with God, remember, Jesus is there to help you. Amen. We come to our time for prayers of the people. I am recording this on Thursday morning, which is the 26th. Last night I saw that there was a mass shooting up in Maine. My wife says Lewiston is a um, quaint little town. Just can't imagine it. And I got thinking, people didn't get to come home last night. Family members waited for loved ones to come home who weren't coming home now. So please, keep the people there in prayer. Also pray that justice may be done against the shooter. Also, we remember the people in Israel and Gaza and the people in Ukraine. Let's spend a few moments in silent prayer now. God, we've spoken to you in the silence of our hearts. Now we wait to hear from you. And amen. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We turn next to our reading of scripture. First, we hear from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning with verse 31. 
The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, <clears throat> a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Then we hear from Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 3, beginning with verse 19. <clears throat> now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be, may be held accountable to God. For no human will be justified before him by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now... Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to demonstrate at the present time his own righteousness, so that he is righteous and he justifies the one who has the faith of Jesus. Then what becomes a boasting? It is excluded. Through what kind of law? That of works? No, rather through the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. And then we hear, excuse me, then we hear from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, beginning with verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The Son has a place there forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Here end our readings for this morning. And our message is entitled, Rediscovering the Gospel Truth Again. But let's pray first. Lord, we ask, speak through these words, speak to our hearts. Amen. Well, happy Reformation Sunday. But first, a word from our sponsors who made it necessary to have a Reformation. Although the Roman Emperor Constantine had been a believer in Jesus for most of his adult life, he held off getting baptized until he was near death in 337 AD. He did this because he believed that the less time between baptism and death, the fewer possibilities for him to sin and therefore pollute his soul. Behind what sounds to us like strange behavior was this belief. I'm not sure how common it was. It went like this. Once you were baptized, you had to remain absolutely sinless for the rest of your life because no further sins could be forgiven. Wow, yikes. Now, if that sounds strange and impossible to us, consider a contemporary of Emperor Constantine, a British or Irish monk 
named Pelagius. Pelagius taught that it was entirely possible for human beings to save themselves by their own efforts. In other words, your own good deeds and perfect behavior were sufficient to get you into heaven. Jesus and the cross would then become just a role model for how we were to live our lives, but the saving would be entirely of our own doing. Again, yikes. Now, add to all this, the tendency throughout the Old Testament for people to worship God with their lips, but not with their hearts. The kings and priests spent a lot of time, and the people's money, doing all the rituals and ceremonies, with incense and burnt offerings, and fancy priestly clothing and all. But to judge by their lives and actions, it was clear that many of them were not putting God first in their lives. In fact, it was this tradition's first attitude that Jesus railed against in the Gospels, calling the religious leaders whitewashed tombs, appearing clean on the outside, but filled with decay and death within. So once again, yikes. Now, roll all three of these yikes together, and you have one of the main problems that has always plagued the church. Believing that we human beings, solely by our own actions, can please God and therefore save ourselves by our, excuse me, save ourselves so we can enter heaven. First, that Old Testament and even New Testament Pharisee tendency to rely on rituals and traditions to please God, well, that never went away. Because that belief, relying on our ritual actions to please God, that carried right over into the church. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with having beautiful rituals, or stained glass, or colorful stoles, or candles, or altar cloths. Nothing wrong with that at all. But when these things become the focus, and worse still, when they become the focus, and people forget about God, then it's a problem. For instance, <laughs> there is a right way to light the altar candles. Actually, there are several right ways to do it. Salem UCC lights them one way. St. Paul's UCC lights them another way. So sure, it's nice when, we, when the way we learned as kids is still being followed today. But is it the end of the world when someone does it differently? Will God smite us for doing it wrong? Of course not. But trust me, I was a member of one church where some folks got so hung up on little things, rituals, that I wondered if they'd forgotten that they are actually there to worship God, not human rituals. Rituals, no matter how perfectly done, are not going to save us. And then look at old Emperor Constantine. Seriously? Wait until you're at death's door to be baptized? If what they say about a certain topic that cross... <laughs> Let me start that again. If what they say about a certain topic that crosses people's minds every seven seconds, well, if that's true, somebody better strangle you right after you get baptized, or you will still manage to commit a sin that can now according to Constantine's way of thinking, it can no longer be forgiven. Good luck with that. And the worst of all, the 5th century monk Pelagius. Saving yourself by your own efforts? Sadly, this heresy, that's what it is, a grave religious error, it's still with us in the church today and is actually the foundation of many of the world's other religions the idea that we can earn our way into heaven in God's favor. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit that gave birth to the church on that first day of Pentecost never abandoned the church. And there are always good people of faith throughout the long history of the church who remained faithful to Jesus Christ and who understood the truth that only Jesus can save us. Despite the church, or its leaders and what they might be teaching. And a thousand years after the monk Pelagius, another monk, and many others with him, 
stood for this truth. Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, John Huss, and others in the late Middle Ages realized that the church had gotten seriously off track. Instead of focusing on the freedom that Jesus gives believers, freedom from sin, freedom from its consequences, the church had gradually reverted to purely human ways of thinking. Rituals, traditions that had become ridiculously ornate, complicated, expensive, they had become the focus of the church. Even today, look at some of the treasures in the older churches and, well, you get the picture. It's, it's incredible. And <clears throat> the doctrine of salvation, far from being a free but undeserved gift from Jesus for all believers, salvation had become a commodity that could be purchased by money or one's deeds. <clears throat> Excuse me. Many of us remember from catechism how during the time of Martin Luther, the church sold indulgences. You see, the church back then taught that people had to purify their lives by their own efforts. So purgatory was the destination for most, a place where they could continue to purge their sin-stained souls after death. But for a few dollars, <clears throat> you could pay to get your dearly departed relative out of purgatory early by purchasing indulgences for them. What a crock. As good Protestants, we don't believe in purgatory. Gradually, Luther and the other reformers came to realize that indulgences and so many other purely human teachings of the church were just that, a crock. Instead of celebrating the unearned mercy that comes through Jesus Christ over the centuries, the church had turned salvation into a purely human enterprise. Do this, do that, pay this, and you'll get to heaven, and all through your own efforts. <clears throat> Thanks be to God that... <clears throat> okay, time for coffee. Thanks be to God that reformers like Luther knew in their gut that something was seriously out of whack in the church. And through his studies of the Bible, and particularly Paul's letter to the Romans, Luther had a breakthrough. Instead of beating himself up with guilt and shame for being a sinner, he read in Romans that believers in Christ are made right with God not by their own actions, but by simply having faith that Jesus had saved them bolstered by this long forgotten but a hundred percent biblical truth luther now knew what the church had lost we are saved by faith not by works romans 1 17 martin luther read this <clears throat> this good news tells us that god uh, yes this good news tells us that god makes us ready for heaven makes us right in God's sight when we put our faith and trust in Christ to save us. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scripture says it, the man who finds life will find it through trusting God. In Romans 3, 26-28, Luther read this, God is righteous, and he justifies the one who has the faith of Jesus. What then becomes a boasting? It is excluded. Through what, <clears throat> through what kind of law? Works? No. Rather, through the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Once Martin Luther and the other reformers figured out where the church had gone wrong and began working to set things right, the ancient words of Jesus finally began to ring true again. If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Yes, they realized, Jesus had set us free from sin and its consequences. But they had enslaved themselves all over again to human traditions and pride. <clears throat> that needed to be corrected. So armed with this rediscovered and all-important truth, salvation by faith, not by good works, the reformers first tried to change and correct the truth from the inside. 
excuse me, change and correct the church from the inside. But no luck there. Sadly, these theological differences will be settled not so much within the church, but more on the battlefield as religious wars swept across Europe over the next couple of centuries. I'd like to say that everything has now been resolved, and true, there are still differences between different denominations, but at least this, we don't kill each other over it anymore. Now we, <clears throat> in the United Church of Christ, are heirs of this Protestant Reformation that began when Martin Luther first posted his concerns on a church door in Germany on October 31st, 1517. Because of him and other genuinely concerned reformers, the truth about salvation was rediscovered. We learned once again what we should have always known. Number one, we cannot save ourselves by our own efforts. And number two, we don't have to because Jesus has already done this for us. All we need to do is trust him completely. So on this Reformation Sunday, be humble enough to admit that you can't do it all by yourself. And then celebrate that in Jesus Christ, it has already been done for you. You have been set free. Set free. Amen. <clears throat> We come to the time of the offering, and as we gather our gifts on this Reformation Sunday, let us be grateful for those inspired by God's Spirit who compelled the church to reform in the past and who continue to do so now where the church needs help. We join together in the doxology. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Lord, through these gifts and your blessing, may your church always be a beacon of hope, grace, love, and light in this world. Amen. Let's join together in our commission and benediction. For all that God can do within us, for all that God can do without us, thanks be to God. For all in whom Christ lived before us, for all in whom Christ lives beside us, thanks be to God. For all the Spirit wants to bring us, for where the Spirit wants to send us, thanks be to God. And now, the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and on your way together, now and forever. Amen. God bless you, and have a good week. <clears throat>